I'm in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. This is a lecture that is a select group of animals as represented in the art and architecture of Mesoamerica. And this is obviously going to be a limited collection of this animal, symbol, human, and imagery relationship. And there will be a several of these little lectures that have to do with animals. This is the first one. And I'm going to be focusing on the relationship between art and architecture of Mesoamerica and this concept of a serpent, the feathered serpent, this kind of animate open maw or large open mouth that can be either a serpentine mouth or it can be sort of a feline mouth. But we are looking at this kind of jagged, monumental, in some ways threatening um, maw that can represent a variety of places, but it is a framework and it can also be a location. And what you see on your screen is a list of the locations that we're going to be kind of cherry picking and examining this idea of serpent and human, serpent and architecture. And this will give you sort of an idea of this relationship between humans and animals and symbols and architecture. This um, slide, again, is a repeat of what I just said, but gives you a more detailed understanding of the actual sort of iconography that I'm going to be discussing with you in this short video lecture. The first will be this idea of the serpent. The second will be the idea of this um, feathered serpent. Another concept that is related often or seen in conjunction with serpents would be a baby jaguar image. And then there's the open mouth or maw imagery that is a frame for a location or a frame for movement or transformation between states of being. One of the concepts um, that I want to really um, sort of emphasize to you is the idea of the relationship to humans and animals, this relationship to these two um, entities together. In many ways, in Mesoamerican art, humans and animals are fused. Um, and in some myths and in some stories and some um, messages, they are either shown as one um, kind of being or they're shown as beings that are really quite intertwined together. And you can see this in sort of the formal aspects of the depiction of humans and animals. Um, I see, what you're seeing here is a map of the prevailing sites and areas of Mesoamerica that we were going to be looking at. And I want you to um, kind of look at the area in the lower right-hand corner of Guatemala. And that is one of the major areas of the Maya um, homeland. Um, and there's uh, a little bit north of Guatemala would be... Um, Chiapas, and that's a state in New Mex in Mexico where the site of Palenque is, and we'll be going to the site of Palenque in one of our um, examples in this lecture. Um, I also want you to move forward through the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and into the Valley of Mexico, which is where Teotihuacan is. That is an enormous, enormous urban center outside of Mexico City, near the modern-day city of Puebla. Um, and then the Valley of Mexico, um, which is today Mexico City, was the, um, the homeland of the Aztec, and it was the center of the Mexica or Aztec Empire. Their capital city is called Teotihuacan. Te oh, no, pardon me. Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan. That is my mistake. Tenochtitlan. Another place that I want you to consider is that we're going to go back towards the um, Isthmus of Tehuantepec and near the Gulf of Campeche and in that area um, sort of to the left of the little sign of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec is the area of um, Chalcatzingo 
which is a outlying settlement that is considered Olmec. We're going to be looking at Petroglyph 1 from that um, area. And another area, we're going to go back to Guatemala, um, and I want you to um, consider the jungles of Guatemala, the very deep and dark jungles of Guatemala, where the site of San Bartolo has recently been found. And when I say recent, it's not that recent. It was 1999. Um, and it's a wonderful story. It was found by mistake um, by a young archaeologist. Uh, and he was actually quite famished and quite desperate for water and just decided to kind of relax and take a nap in this um, looter's trench and discovered when he woke up from his nap that he was surrounded by these extraordinary murals. So this is really a story out of a novel, but it is real life. And it often happens in these um, very um, uh, remote areas that are known only to um, sort of trappers and people who live in these small, small villages that don't have a lot of um, contact with the outside world. I wanted to kind of begin our talk about um, animals and nature and humans by looking at this very, very famous and very um, wonderful representation of a conch shell trumpet. And it is made of andesite stone, which is an igneous rock. I think that the fact that it is an, a rock that is formed through um, a volcanic eruption is very important. I'm not sure if the creators of this work knew that it came from volcanic rock and it came from fire and the bowels of the earth, but there is something very important to know that this work um, was made of a stone or a surface that um, was created through destruction and fire. But through destruction and fire comes life. And I think that everything is very cyclical in these discussions of Mesoamerican iconography and symbolism and myth. And I think that this is something that is very much a part of that um, concept of the world. This is a over life size image of a shell. And as you can see, it's slightly abstracted. It almost looks like something out of maybe um, 1930s uh, architecture or art deco or art moderne styles because it's rounded and it is very much um, uh, sinuous and curvaceous. But I want to point to your attention the interior incised lines that denote this conch shell exterior and the development of this trumpet-like um, formation that sticks out um, on the left side. This is a really extraordinary piece. It's very, very heavy. It's very hard stone and it's very smooth to the touch if you were to see it. I look at this work as a portrait of a shell, but it is almost like a visual poem, a love letter to shells and to water. What I also like about it is that the stereotype of the Mexica and the Aztec empire is one that is filled with violence and sacrifice and kind of aggressive ritual. And this is an image that was found inside of the Temple Mayor, and we'll talk more about it. And it is one of probably the most sensitive depictions and really lifelike depictions of an quote unquote inanimate object, an object that was the home of another animal. And continuing on with this trumpet um, shell, uh, image, I wanted to give you a quote from Eduardo Matas Montezuma, who is the art ar head archaeologist for the Templo Mayor excavations in Mexico City. 
And as you know, um, through some other introductory um, PowerPoints and readings that I have given you, the Temple of Maiar is the main temple, the great temple of the Aztec Empire, and it is in the um, heart of the ceremonial precinct of Tenochtitlan. But his quote, I feel, works nicely for this lecture and is applicable to all of the different cultures of, of Mesoamerica, not just the Aztecs. Whoever made this not only gave life to the form itself, but also united volume and rhythm, recreating through the gentle spreading of lines, the constant and eternal movement of symbolic life. So let's break this quote down. The idea of symbolic life represents the idea of an object or an image standing in for something else. Um, but when you join the idea of symbol with life, that complicates the idea of a symbol. And I think that the shell works nicely with that because the shell itself looks alive. There is an animate and dynamic quality to the shell's depiction that is um, unusual. Um, and that also ties into the very first sentence of this quote. The other um, part of this quote that I wanted to um, focus on is the idea of recreating, which is um, really tied to so much of Mesoamerican ideology, is this constant search for life and life-giving forces, both natural and supernatural. And human beings allied themselves with the sacred natural environment, which is composed of mountains and trees and corn and earth and water, but also the sacred um, supernatural worlds, um, which, is, which can be populated by different um, entities that are uh, like deities or they are spiritual um, beings that capture um, the essence of a feeling, of an anxiety, of a need, or of cycles, such as the corn god, or corn itself captures this idea of the cycles of life and death, but in parallel, it captures the cycles of the life of corn. And corn was the staple of life for Mesoamerica. Without water, without earth, without nutrients, there is no corn and there is no life. But on the other hand, the sources that are destructive, that we think of as destructive, are also life-giving. And I alluded to that earlier in my talk with the idea of fire. Fire is a destructive force in so much of our world in the 21st century when we think of forest fires but fire also creates life because it is a form of fertilizing the earth and um, it creates warmth, it creates life, and it creates light. So think about these natural elements and the natural environment and how the natural environment and these natural elements can come together to create a, an essential group of entities that are unexplainable. And that's where we kind of think about um, uh, naming or creating or acknowledging deities outside of our known um, world. The quotes that I have here the, in yellow, I have the observations above are related to all Mesoamerican peoples and their complex relationship to nature and animals. Symbols from many ancient Amer Mesoamerican cultures were embedded with the essence of the animal and representations were iconic, but also living. And here's another really nice photo of this um, trumpet conch shell in situ as it is being pulled from the, inter the interior spaces of the Temple Mayor and it was on the Talalak side of the Temple Mayor, which is the side of the Temple Mayor that celebrated and, and possibly represented water. This is Petroglyph 1, 
or it's a representation of petroglyph one from Chalcatzingo in Morelos, uh, Mexico. Um, and in previous PowerPoints and lectures, I've given you I've given you some of the more pertinent information about this work. We are going to be looking at it because it is very early in our chronology of imagery of animals and humans, and because it gives us a basis for looking at this kind of open ma representation. And you can see that as a half of a, um, um, of a, uh, of a, oh, um, like a um, trefoil image. It's one half of a trefoil. Or it is a trefoil that would become a quatrefoil. So, excuse me, it's one half of a trefoil that eventually becomes a quatrefoil symbol. And what I mean by that are these curved lines that create this opening where this individual is seated inside. That can be, um, this in this particular example, it's a very abstracted kind of maw. It is um, a mouth, but it is also a cave opening. It is also a fissure in the earth which can be a cave, or it can be just sort of broken pieces of rock that create an opening. And inside of this opening is um, a human being sitting there. But something else that is very, very indicative of this idea of living spaces and the conjunction between the sacred environment, animals, and humans, would be these swirls of air-like motifs that emanate from this trefoil design. And these swirls are represented of air or breath or even sound, moans. If you ever were to go to a cave, caves are animate places. There are sounds in caves. They can be the drips of moisture coming from stalactites. But they can also be air that circulates inside of cave passages and complexes, and that air bounces off the walls and makes sounds. And sometimes those sounds can be quite comforting and interesting, and sometimes they can be a little off-putting, too. So it's almost like the earth is moaning. Um, also, the earth makes sounds when the earth is moving. If you have ever been in an earthquake, the earth will groan. There is a rumbling sound. And it is quite out of this world. I have been in an earthquake, and I was struck by the loudness of the earth's moaning. And we are looking at a region of the world where earthquakes do occur, where certain tectonic movements occur. Maybe not as dramatic as a earthquake per se that you might see in Southern California, but tectonic movements do occur in Mesoamerica. And it's, it's important to note that everything is moving and everything is alive. So this image shows us a relationship to um, Earth and humans together. It also shows us um, the animacy of the Earth as perhaps a, a being not an animal, but it is a being, a thing that is um, considered in the cosmology of Mesoamerican peoples. Um, and it also um, is reminiscent of an open maw or a mouth that could be considered both feline or um, a raptor, like um, some kind of um, a meat hunting um, eagle like uh, bird um, or even a raptorial, um, um, a reptile, pardon me, a reptile. Okay. This is the overall concept, I mean, the overall context of Chalcatzingo, and it is a mountain, is mountainous area. And um, something I wanted to also um, just touch upon is the fact that mountains were considered alive and mountains were places of knowledge, of water, of the creation of water, and of the creation of humans. So we will be looking at several examples of mountains that are human-made, and those human-made mountains are also sacred, 
and also are imbued with many of the sacred attributes that natural mountains have. This is another example of the relationship between animals and humans, but also humans and the sacred um, man-made or human-made built environment. This is a cutaway view, um, uh, an architectural model of the structure that housed the murals from San Bartolo. And we're specifically going to be looking at just one wall of murals at the upper, upper register of the walls. These are polychrome murals and they are old. They are um, about a thousand years old and they are quite extraordinary. When they were found, as I mentioned to you in 1999 by William Saturno, they really, they really supported but also changed so much of the trajectory of Mesoamerican studies. And these murals are in a structure that is at the very base of a large um, temple structure. So just again telling you that they are they're creating imagery of humans and animals in ritual inside of a structure that is associated with a large human-made temple slash mountain. This is an actual photo of the murals today in one of the tunnels where they are doing archaeological and preservation work on these images. They were painted on the wall, um, but there was a thin coating of stucco that was placed on the stone first, and then these polychrome images were applied to the stone with the stucco um, covering. These are natural pigments, and you're seeing uh, something called Maya red, a lot of red, and we believe that this Maya red came from this hematite stone, where if you add some water to hematite stone, it um, actually becomes viscous and can be turned into a pigment that is like paint. And it has this sort of lovely, um, rich, um, sort of Hollywood red. And that is very much seen uh, uh, commonly in Mesoamerican mural painting. The other thing I want you to pay attention to would be this line that runs, it sort of is like an axis that goes through this slide and it's diagonal, it goes from the bottom of the um, left side to sort of mid top of the right side of the slide. And be aware that this line is a ground line, similar to what we would see in our own um, uh, Western ideas of ground lines and organization of, of um, compositions, but it also is the body of a snake. And here I'm going to profile this with a little line with my cursor so you can see it a little bit better. This is a little pixelated, but I want to point out that ground line for you. I'm, I'm showing that with my cursor. And we are looking at the north wall, um, drawing by um, Heather Hurst, who at the time was in graduate school and she did this, now she is a professor. Um, and I want you to kind of look at this, and there, I have a better image, but this sort of bubbly, um, sinuous form here that I'm profiling with my cursor. And then um, these other figures that seem to be holding things up or maybe even dancing in animate form and in various costumes or um, regalia. Here's a close-up of that sort of bubbly form that I wanted you to consider. And here we have it. Um, I want you to kind of spend some time looking at it closely. Um, but uh, some of the characteristics of this, of this form, which I find very interesting, that relate to the image from Chalkatzingo Petroglyph 1, would be the fact that this is reminiscent of a, um, of a triglyph um, open maw motif. But more importantly, we have these curvy, sort of air-like um, designs that are emanating out of this space. And in fact, we actually have a stalactite too, which seems to be hanging down from the roof of this 
ma-like um, space. So I think uh, there's every reason to believe that we are looking at the opening of a cave. And we have other animals that seem to be um, peering through this opening. We also have another one, these little triglyph um, design motifs. This seems like it's a salamander or some um, uh, footed animal, very friendly looking. And then another, a snake here. So this image seems to be very focused on design and um, color and form and sinuous lines. We also have um, a, a jaguar here uh, and um, blood seems to be coming out of his mouth. So we have a, an array of different natural animals and figures. We have a maiden in the middle of this um, opening who is uh, giving a gift to um, a ceremonial um, um, uh, um, uh, just sort of an activity here. I don't want to get into too much detail, but she is giving corn tamales. We believe that she's giving corn tamales to this figure here who is kneeling, and we believe that this could um, be uh, the corn god here who is standing and receiving these various gifts. This is another um, dip, sort of a, um, a larger view of what we just looked at. And I wanted you to, again, follow your eye towards this ground line. And here is a serpent. So what does this serpent represent in this image? We are looking at an overall image of ritual, perhaps um, the birth, or maybe a the corn deity um, being um, given gifts of, um, of perhaps his station in life. Um, he is moving towards maturity. Um, we have a birthing scene on this side, which I'm not going to go into um, in that much detail, but this is a very central image of this very powerful figure. We have other figures who are giving gifts to this individual. But you're seeing a connection between um, this cave opening and this ground line, and it seems like a very extraordinary feathered serpent. And if you look closely, you can see feet on this road. And the feet on this road indicate pathways and movement. And if we look even further, we might even get an idea that this is a whole entire mouth that we are looking at. So we're looking at the top of a mouth, the, the, the lid, or the, um, the, 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 um, the, the palate of a mouth, and then perhaps the bottom of the mouth. This is a maw that is encircling this sacred ceremony inside that deals with corn maidens, the um, corn deity, and people giving him gifts of life, um, of thanks, of sacrifice. Another view of this pretty um, special mural. Now I want to switch over and change our location to central Mexico. And we're going to be looking at Teotihuacan, the main, and we're, this is just sort of an overview of the main ceremonial axis of the ancient city. The picture is taken from the facade steps of the Temple of the Moon, and the Temple of the Sun is to the left. And here's a map of where Teotihuacan is, so you get a better indication of the geography. And this is a plan of the city of Teotihuacan. And you can tell that this city is absolutely organized around an axis. And it is organized in regions and neighborhoods very similar to what we would have in our modern cities today, kind of on the grid system. And if we are going to spend some of our time at the very bottom of this grid, um, and we're going to be looking at the Temple Pyramid of the Feathered Serpent. And this particular Temple Pyramid is in a protected and sacred space. It's also called the Ciudadela, which backs up in front of the Temple Pyramid of the Feathered Serpent. The Ciudadela was perhaps a municipal building where leaders of the city um, collected and worked. 
And the temple pyramid of the feathered serpent may have been a memorial or some kind of um, symbolic mountain that celebrated warfare and life and sort of the, um, you might say, the hot spot of Teotihuacanos, their power. This is a very old sort of archaeological um, and documentary photo. I like it because it's, it really gives us a lot of shadows in the black and white image of the um, temple of the feathered serpent. And this particular temple is really important to us for this particular lecture because of its facade decoration, its outside decoration, which is composed of stone mosaics, huge, huge stone mosaics weighing several thousand pounds. Um, and there are layers and layers of these stone mosaics that come together and like a puzzle pieces, they come together to create faces and images um, uh, of the feathered serpent and then also this um, mosaic um, uh, war deity, a goggle-eyed mosaic war deity made and we believe that he could be um, this particular face of this war deity could be um, made up of um, stones, um, blue stones of various types. They could be um, all kinds of blue stones that you find in Mesoamerica and in, Native, in North America. So that could be jade um, and um, turquoise. This is a um, exterior plan and image of the reconstruction of the um, Temple of the Feathered Serpent. And you can see it's really complicated. It kind of has two temples to it. And it is a um, square structure with um, uh, platforms that eventually um, uh, move upward in elevation and have a super, that has a superstructure on top. But each one of the faces of this platform has this extraordinary um, mosaic sculpture of the feathered serpent and the goggle-eyed war deity. And here you have it um, right here in a really nice um, visual, um, a nice photograph. And this is um, an example of Talud Tablero architectural style that you see in um, central Mexico at Teotihuacan and Tenochtitlan. Um, and uh, Talu Tablero really um, is Spanish for the idea of sort of um, uh, a flat space and a slanted space, and it was used primarily for architectural sculpture. It was decorating these platforms, but also created a surface for these extensive, complex, and monumental sculpture. And just take a moment to look at this facade. Each one of these faces is, is several meters high and several tons in weight. And this whole structure, we believe, was painted. This is a reconstruction of the painted surface of the Temple of the Feathered Serpent and then a detail of a feathered serpent figure. Now, feathered serpents, um, and we saw a feathered serpent, a potential feathered serpent, an early feathered serpent at the San Bartolo um, murals, was a um, uh, an entity um, that had rattles at the very end of his tail, and the feathered serpent um, has is a very um, uh, multi vocal um, entity. He is representative of kind of identity markers, perhaps for. Mesoamerican peoples who um, centered in the um, central Mexican region, but also you do see feathered serpents among the Maya in the Maya lowlands. Um, but this particular entity um, has a uh, supernatural quality of, um, of life and water. Um, and the combination of the serpent powers related to um, um, birds and flying. Their feathered serpents fly through the air and have um, uh, powers of flight. So it's interesting that these two entities, both a snake and serpent, and the, um, the avian qualities are 
um, combined in this one individual. But it makes a lot of sense because serpents fly through the earth almost with the rapidity of their movements and in water and birds fly in perhaps the same kind of trajectories in the sky. Here's a close-up of this particular um, um, animal and surrounding him is um, different conch shells. Um, you can see the rattles to the right side and other types of um, um, shells and this entity has been created in a very realistic manner. It is obviously abstracted because it is a, is a um, deity um, who we don't never necessarily see in reality, but you can tell exactly his snout, his mouth, his teeth, his eyes, his ears, and this really um, marvelous serpent um, head shape crowned by the feathers around his neck. And this is a detail of the um, mosaic, stone mosaic image of the goggle-eyed war deity associated with Teotihuacan. And here is a comparison between the latter part of the San Bartolo murals with the feathered serpent and the feathered serpent that you see on the um, exterior of the temple of the um, feathered serpent. And inside the Temple of the Feathered Serpent are um, burials of many, many um, warriors, soldiers, and accoutrement of their, um, of their position in the society. So this is a temple that is perhaps honoring um, the core of Teotihuacan's power and their militaristic power, but also perhaps honoring their identity as well. Another example of this uh, kind of open mouth, feathered serpent, um, animate cave is going to be the bottom half of the sarcophagus cover of um, King Pakal's sarcophagus from the site of Palenque. And a sarcophagus is a stone tomb, and the so stone sarcophagus cover at Palenque is one of the major, major pieces of Mesoamerican and specifically Maya art. It is housed inside of this temple, the Temple of the Inscriptions at the site of Palenque. Here's a diagram of the interior space of the Temple of the Inscriptions, and at the very bottom of that um, sort of uh, right angle, um, um, zigzag staircase is the sarcophagus, buried deep inside. This is a photograph of the sarcophagus, very close to the moment that it was um, found and that the archaeologists actually walked into this space. And you can see how enormous it is. It is, again, over life size. Um, Pakal is positioned at the very middle of this per sarcophagus cover, and he is in the position of a child, like a newborn. And um, he is basically, I would say, a little bit over life size. But you can see that he is framed by this skeletal open maw, similar to what you saw at Chalcatzingo and similar to what you saw at San Bartolo. Here's a detail of another animal figure that I wanted to profile that is found on the cover of the sarcophagus. This is a bicephalic or two-headed serpent that is intertwined inside of this cross. So we're seeing a series of animals together in this sarcophagus cover. And um, another representation of this open maw is in these two-headed, in this is in this two-headed serpent. Here's a detail of the open maw from the base of the sarcophagus cover. And as you can tell, it's skeletal, but there is at the very bottom a little bit of, of perhaps hair. And he is being cradled and being framed by this open mouth. So structurally or and or formally, in its formal, in a formal analysis, we are looking at this maw that is being used as a frame. Is it used to emphasize Pakal's body? that is kind of balancing on top of this pedestal-like 
entity, and he is shown as an adult young man, but his position is that of almost an infant. Along with the idea of an open maw and infants and birth or rebirth, we just saw Pakal inside of the skeletal maw on his sarcophagus cover shown as this vital essential male. But in fact, his position is that it's almost an infant. And he is shown as perhaps the corn deity in this particular image. So we are looking at a connection between corn deities, cycles of life, the interior of a cave or the interior of the earth, an open maw, and birth, rebirth, and renewal, which is closely tied to the cycles of agriculture. On this image, in this image that you're seeing is the rebirth of the maize god, depicted on a classic period polychrome Maya vase, all of these themes come together on this very um, interesting, it's very fun, um, cartoon-like, but really quite beautiful, beautiful depiction of the birth of the maize god. And the maize god, again, is right here. So we've really seen um, three images of the maize god. One is from San Bartolo. One would be from um, Pakal, as depicted as the maize god on his sarcophagus cover. And here we're seeing him being born um, amidst um, this sort of dark, otherworldly place associated with other animals, this very interesting bird whose head is not quite decapitated, and he's surrounded by other deities. And you're seeing right here this very, very extensive open mouth of the serpent with twisted cords that um, uh, are his body. Um, but then there are other serpents around here. So the idea of twisted cords, um, serpents that fly, um, serpents that fly in the water, um, and even perhaps taking it further to the idea of a sarcop um, pardon me, to the idea of a um, umbilicus that is twisted. Um, these are all um, conduits, you might say, for life. An umbilicus is uh, a natural um, feeding tube that we all have, and we all have belly buttons. And so we're looking at combinations of messaging through similar images. The idea of a snake body that twists and turns is like a cord or an umbilical cord. Um, snakes can swim and fly in the water, on the ground, like birds in the sky. And all of these animals are life-giving animals. They are um, harbingers of storms. They are harbingers of the changing seasons. And they um, sort of provide, and I hate to use this word, but sometimes it works, they provide sort of a a graceful and magical quality to our daily lives. And here we have some other very end photos of um, a recreation of Pakal's sarcophagus cover and of his burial chamber, which is at the museum in Mexico City. And you can see his body is inside of this burial chamber. The sarcophagus is on top. I mean, the sarcophagus cover is on top. Um, one of the last images that I'm going to show you um, this is the penultimate image of this lecture, is the, um, the birth or just this image that it's a birth and it's a sacrifice of the baby jaguar. And so we're looking at layers upon layers of multivocal symbols. The baby jaguar can also be related to um, babies um, and corn deities um, and life-giving um, entities. We have this baby jaguar here that is laying down in a similar position to Pakal in a sacrificial position. And then we have this really um, uh, animate and lovely image of um, Chalk, who is the bringer of water. And he is dancing around this baby jaguar. 
And then we have a death deity on another side of the Davy Jaguar. So he is basically being presented, and he's also being um, flanked by water and death, which are these two um, sort of endpoints of life. Also, when you are born, you are born in water. And so that is another really key component to birth um, and life and the continuation of life. Another um, feature of this really um, dazzling depiction of this story is this is an open maw of a, um, of a serpent. And it seems as though this chalk or water deity is being pushed out of this open maw or being framed by this open maw. And then the baby, Jaguar, is laying upon this interesting sort of chair-like entity. And actually, this is an animate stone. It's a stone that has sort of um, an energy to it. And it is alive. It's a stone that is that is kind of um, uh, has a dynamism and an essence to it that is very stony, yet very alive. So this work gives us sort of an, a further layering and complexity of many of these animals that share attributes with the natural world, and they share attributes with humanity, with humans. Um, they've been anthropomorphized, as well as they are telling us a story of the cyclicality of life. This is the pot. Um, it's a handheld object, and in order to really see the whole story, you have to turn the pot in your hand. What I showed you previously was a rollout image of this particular painted pot. The last example that I want to show you comes from the Aztec Empire, or the Mexica. So we started this lecture with, um, a, uh, with the monumental conch shell from the Tlaloc side of the Temple Mayor, and we will be ending the lecture by looking at the Temple Mayor. The Sacred Temple Mayor and Ceremonial Precinct um, is an effigy of a sacred mountain. Rituals at the temple reflected the myths, sacred rites, and identity of the Mexica. So many of these ideas that I am profiling for the Mexica are applicable to all the other cultures in Mesoamerica that we've looked at. Precinct was a sacred location, and the architecture, imagery, decoration all work together to create a cosmo vision. And that is the word that um, Eduardo Matos Montezuma, the head archaeologist for the uh, Templo Mayor archaeological project, really calls this as the center of this cosmo vision of the ceremonial precinct. This is an overlay of the Templo Mayor um, on contemporary. Um, uh, Mexico City architecture and urban planning. Right now, none of these buildings exist. Um, Eminent Domain has taken over all of these colonial buildings in order to really uh, do some um, very detailed excavations of this ceremonial precinct. But what I also want to show you is the massive nature of this temple, but also of the fact that this temple is composed of two sides, two temple shrines at the very, very top. One is for Huichtlapochtli, who is the deity of war and fire. The other one is for Tlaloc. Here you have a slide that really um, gives you an example of the double pyramid nature of the Temple Mayor. And the water side, Tlaloc side, is, not surprisingly, uses a lot of blue in its coloration. And the Huichtlapochtli side, not surprisingly, uses a lot of red. What I find interesting and is a wonderful way to sort of end this lecture is that the Huichtlapochtli side um, has its own style of um, architectural decoration, but the Tlaloc side has some really monumental images of these feathered serpents. And the feathered serpents that you see here are very similar to the Temple of the Feathered Serpent from Teotihuacan. Now, Teotihuacan and um, the Mexica, or the Aztec, were um, many, many years, almost a thousand years, in terms of the differences of their chronology. Yet, the Mexica considered this extraordinary and massive city um, adjacent to their own city, 
as kind of the city of their gods. And so much of their architecture and a lot of their architectural decoration is inspired by the imagery of Teotihuacan. So you're seeing sort of a, a rebirth of Teotihuacan styles and mythologies, although the Mexica created so many of their own ideas as well. So these are uncovered representations of snakes that um, are sort of cascading down the staircase of this massive temple. I'm not able to show you like a real comprehensive photograph of them or of the temple because the temple is in ruins and is being excavated. It was raised or ruined during the conquest in 1521 by um, Cortez. But some pieces are still with us and you can see that this particular um, snake is painted in red and so much of that has to do with the idea of blood and life um, and um, and passion I mean which is kind of a silly way of talking about life but the idea of continuing life through red blood and perhaps even um, the, the idea of water giving us um, our lifeblood. One of the more interesting aspects of the Temple Mayor is that on each side of the Temple Mayor are hidden caches of um, objects that were placed inside of the structure in celebration for the structure's meaning. So on the Tlaloc, or water side, of the Temple Mayor, we have caches and burial um, uh, specific boxes of collected goods. But the collected goods inside of the Temple Mayor, on the Tlaloc side, all have to do with water and water animals. So this picture shows you many different types of shells and coral but also of alligator skeletons and different um, types of animals, just detailed with all of their bones. Um, we have shark bones, and we also have um, different bones that come from um, uh, uh, turtles and other marine and water creatures. So I want to emphasize the idea of burial and sort of subterranean spaces as spaces of birth and of rebirth and the idea of animals and humans coming together to create life and to create um, a, an ideology that spans several thousand years within the Mesoamerican um, lived experience.